I would also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Yagara and the Turrbal people, who are the custodians of the land where I live and work. I pay my respects to Indigenous elders and I extend that, extend that respect to all First Nations people joining us this morning. So good morning and welcome. It's an absolute joy and pleasure to be here. And this morning we are talking about nudity in art. We all have nude and naked bodies. I have one this morning, you all have them as well. Uh, and so this morning I would like us to especially take care of our bodies while we listen to this talk. So stretch, move, find somewhere comfortable, uh, love and look after your body as we talk about nudity in art. So this is an absolutely huge topic. It extends all the way back to Neolithic cultures when tiny nude figurines were used as fertility symbols. In ancient Greece, Nude statues first appeared in cemeteries where they were a way of marking and remembering the dead. And then as artists developed their technical skills, their mastery over stone, nude statues were used to reinforce gender ideals. So the idea of the perfect heroic male body versus these depictions of uh, nude women's bodies that are coy and modest. Centuries later, in Renaissance, uh, artists were reproducing these conventions when we see nude goddesses painted in the landscape. And then finally, in modern Europe, artists started turning their attention to real people and real bodies, capturing nudity in bedrooms and bathrooms. But this morning, as we see from the images that I have on screen, my attention is much more on recent engagements with the nude and especially focusing on real, live, naked human bodies. So with this kind of focus in mind, we took to social media to ask all of you, have you ever been nude for art? And we found some quite interesting results. On Facebook, approximately 75% of you said, yes, you have been nude for art. And then it turns out that Instagram had a very different response over on Instagram. 25% only said that they had been nude. There was a much stronger uh, movement towards not being nude on Instagram, a kind of surprising result. What we have on screen is the four key images that I'll be talking about today in order to explore this question of why does the art world delight in the naked body? So we'll be starting off with Eve Klein and thinking about what is the nude versus the naked body. Uh, then using Deborah Kelly, we'll be thinking about who has been the subject of nudity throughout art history. Down in that bottom left corner, we have Abramovic and Ule, where we'll be thinking about power structures and power dynamics as they relate to clothing and skin. And finally, we'll consider artists who encourage us as members of the audience to take off our clothes and leave them at home. At the end of each of these discussions, there will be time for questions and comments. So please do use that chat function and I will try to get to you. All right, let's dive in with our first artwork and also our very first poll. Lucinda, if you could please launch that for us. So what I'm asking this morning is, if you took off your clothes in the gallery, are you naked 
or are you nude? What do you think? I'll give you a moment to answer that question while I tell you about this work. Wonderful to see the results flooding in. So this is a performance artwork by Eve Klein. He's one of my absolute favorite artists. He had a brilliant but very short lived career. And this is one of his most significant works, Anthropometries of the Blue Period. Now we see Klein in the middle of the photograph. I'm just gonna point him out here. So this is Eve Klein dressed in a suit. Behind him we have a string ensemble. Just off to the right you can see a very smartly dressed audience member and then of course at the centre of the image, at the heart of this performance, is two unclothed models. At Klein's instruction they have covered the front half of their bodies with blue paint and then with the assistance of plinths over on the left hand side of the photograph, they are stepping up in order to press their bodies against the canvas. So in this work, Klein is cleverly combining established conventions in art history with new experimental ways of doing things. So the convention that we have here is Eve Klein, the male artistic genius, and the appearance of nude female bodies. But the difference, of course, is that this is not a traditional method of painting. He's not alone in the studio with his paintbrush and his canvas. Instead, he's performing live in front of an audience, and he's replaced the artist's traditional tools with live human beings. He called these models living paintbrushes. So are they naked or nude? Oh, good results here. So almost half of us have said that they're naked. 37% have said that they're nude and a small grouping of us have said, I don't know. Well, we can turn to art historians to help us uh, think about this distinction. So it was the British art historian Kenneth Clark who argued that the distinction between nudity and nakedness lies in the realm of delight and shame or beauty and indecency. What he says is that the nude operates in the realm of art where it is for intentional public and collective viewing. Whereas nakedness belongs to the real world, it belongs to private spaces and intimate exchanges. So according to this framework, Klein's models are nude. Let's spend a moment looking at the impressions that they've created. So we see the trace of this performance here in anthropometry of the blue period. Five suspended bodies appear across the canvas. Despite the lack of detail, these are immediately recognizable as female bodies. We can make out two breasts, rounded torsos and the tops of two thighs. If we think about Semiotics, these are indexical markings. That means that they provide a direct link or a kind of form of evidence of the real bodies that made them. And this is very different from uh, the paintbrush, which mimics or recreates the female form. In moving away from verisimilitude and toward traces of the body, Klein joins in one of the longest histories uh, in art that dates back to early Indigenous rock art practices. And on the second image, we see Dale Harding, a local Indigenous artist who is bringing this long history of mark making 
into the present. I want you to have a close look at this photograph. You can see that Dale Harding is holding a shovel and he is blowing blue pigment in order to stencil the outline of this shovel directly onto the wall in quite beautiful overlapping patterns. This use of blue immediately calls to mind Eve Klein's very famous blue. But for Dale Harding, it also references a blue laundry powder that was used by Indigenous domestic servants in colonial Australia. So he's kind of mixing up the symbolic references there. For hundreds of years, Western artists painted and sculpted the nude in order to show off their technical mastery. But with the invention of the camera, artists moved away from mimicry, hoping to demonstrate that they could convey something else or something different from photography. And so now we have different ways of representing the body, especially abstracted ways like this. Here we see Klein alongside a sweeping of other nude bodies. Take a moment to look at these diverse representations. What kind of similarities do you see among these nudes? We might say that femininity is conjured by rounded shapes. These bodies either belong in a kind of contextless zone or in the natural landscape. They're all in quite languid poses. They're kind of lying, relaxing. Uh, we might even say writhing about that last photograph. And they're all anonymous bodies. They're kind of unaware of our gaze. We could even say that they're mute you'll notice that uh, almost three of them don't have mouths or any kinds of facial features. And Kenneth Clark can also help us to think about these nudes. He says, no nude, however abstract, should fail to arouse in a spectator some vestige of erotic feeling, even if it be only the faintest shadow. And if it doesn't, it is bad art and false morals. So Clark is making an argument here that the nude is always about desire, but it's also about a kind of indulgent and uninhibited power and pleasure in looking. So if there's kind of desire connected to the nude, how does this remain in the world of art? And when does this slip into the world of pornography? These two artworks help us to think about the fact that there are shifting boundaries and inconsistencies in the way that we define what is art and what isn't art, what is nude and what is naked. On the left, we're looking at Gustave Courbet's Origin of the World. This painting depicts a naked woman amongst rumpled bed sheets. The frame and the sheets function to crop her arms, her legs and her head, removing her identity and focusing our attention squarely on the flesh of her body. We view her from below and from in between her legs. This is an exceptionally voyeuristic and highly erotic viewpoint. And so this was not painted with the intention of being hung in a gallery. Instead, it was made for a private commission. It would have been kept within a private room in the home and it only would have been viewed among friends after a few drinks and cigars. 
But that was 150 years ago. And today this work hangs in the Musée d'Orsay in France, one of the most significant galleries in the world. The gallery praises Courbet's daring provocativeness, arguing that although he skirts dangerously close to pornography, that his work is rescued into the realm of art because of his technical mastery and his stunning composition. In 2014, the Luxembourg artist Deborah de Robertus put on a gold dress mimicking the frame of this artwork and sat on the gallery floor in front of the artwork and revealed her vulva. She was quickly approached by gallery staff and she was arrested. So this formal response to her performance reinforces all of those dichotomies set out by Kenneth Clark. It kind of reinforces the painting as nude and her as naked. The painting is beautiful and her as indecent. The painting as inviting, but her body as confronting. So in this performance, De Robertus uses her own naked body to force us to think about the conventions around what is nude and what is naked. She's literally inserting herself between us and Corbet's painting. And she's asking us to consider why is it that particular contexts and particular conventions encourage us to consume women's bodies while real women with real agency are turned away from our gaze. All kinds of rich questions in these artworks. Okay, let's pause for a moment to take some questions and comments. So we have from Eureka. She loves Gordon Bennett's reference to Klein's work and just realised that it's an homage. Uh, there's a Gordon Bennett exhibition opening up at Clag Gloma soon. Estelle says that she doesn't understand the connection between the shovel and the nude. So the connection that I was making there is in the form of mark making. So we have bodies being pressed against a canvas uh, and in Dale Harding's work we have a kind of stenciling that is coming out from pigment in his mouth. So these are not traditional ways of representing either a nude or a shovel. They're not painted, they're not sculpted, instead there's a form of performance and trace there. And the kind of argument that I'm making here is that this is not something that Eve Klein or modern artists invented, but that this dates back to the earliest Indigenous rock art. What else do we have? Ah, yes, Ilian. Ilian says that the Klein nudes remind her of the dancers from Matisse. Well done. Full points to you, Ilian. That is absolutely perfect. And we do see very strong parallels between Klein's work and Matisse's works. Uh, this particular collage he made uh, in very old age sitting in his bed, but it is also very much reminiscent of Matisse's dancing nudes. I almost put them into this talk. Huzzah. You're welcome, Estelle. Okay. So De Robertus uh, helps us to think about self-representation in relation to the nude. Let's take a little moment to look at these six self-portraits. Uh, a few photographs, a couple of paintings, and also a lithograph. And Lucinda, can we launch our second poll? If you were to self-represent yourself in the nude, which style would you go for? And I'll tell you a little bit about these artists a 
as you vote. So Adrian Piper is a mixed race uh, African American artist. She is also an internationally renowned philosopher and she's interested in identity, gender and race. Wonderful to see those results coming in. Uh, we then have Jenny Seville. She is a British painter who was originally associated with the Young British Artist or the YBAs, and she's famous for her fleshy explorations of corpulent, vulnerable, and complex female bodies. The next two artists, Greg Semu and Yuki Kihara, are both New Zealand artists with Samoan heritage, and both of them are using photographic self portraiture to reclaim it from colonial uses. Samu trains his camera on the mid region of his body in order to capture his traditional tattoo, while Kihara mimics ethnographic studio portraiture in order to highlight and undo Western assumptions about gender as binary. And then we have two Australian artists, Yvette Coppersmith and Tyza Stewart. Coppersmith's portrait conjures the absolutely joyous collision of line and colour that was made famous in Australian modernism, so around the kind of 30s and 40s. And she describes the nude self-portrait as a kind of armour so it's both a form of protection and something that's on public display. By contrast, Tyza Stewart almost disappears in their self-portrait. There's a melting kind of nothingness in their work. All right, let's share those results and see what we went with. We have a lot of modest and anonymous that has been our winner so far. Uh, followed by a warts and all fleshy and confronting, lovely to see. I mean, I am definitely a paint in pink and call me pretty. I just love Yvette Coppersmith self-portrait here. So in Western art, self-portraiture stems all the way back to the medieval era when monks first began including their likenesses in illuminated manuscripts. This declared and documented that I was here. Self-portraits are an interesting topic for artists. They're kind of endlessly fascinating because they present the problem of trying to capture an external likeness when of course one only ever knows and really experiences oneself from the inside. For women, First Nation artists, artists of colour and non-binary artists, self-portraits also offer a method for wresting control of their image away from straight white men and the cliches and stereotypes that have plagued Western visual culture. So self-portraiture is a way of artists telling their own stories through their own bodies. And this certainly is part of Adrian Piper's artwork, but another very interesting kind of impetus also underpins this project, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Take a close look at this photograph. What can you see and what can't you make out? I'll give you a moment just to look. So we can just make out the artist's face, a lock of hair over her shoulder, one nipple, a camera held against her torso, and the kind of outlines of her thighs. Piper took this photograph in the summer of 1971, when she had isolated herself in her New York loft 
in order to fast, practice yoga, and dedicate herself to reading Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. When the artist sensed her cerebral over-engagement with the text, which felt to her like a kind of bodily disappearance, she would stand in front of her mirror. She would repeat excerpts from the text and she would take a photograph of her naked body. So in other words, when Piper felt herself becoming lost in the immaterial world of philosophy, she grounded herself through the physical acts of speaking, looking, and documenting her body. Really kind of interesting way of bringing herself back into the present, kind of mindfulness before we knew what the word mindfulness knew. And she did this repeatedly throughout that period of reading uh, the critique of pure reason. So what we're looking at is this one of many photographs. And this durational or repeated documentary aspect of Piper's work was really central to conceptual artworks made at the same time. Here we see two more of these kind of documentary typologies. Let's spend a moment just looking at these two artworks and thinking about their formal similarities. So what's shared across both of these artworks. And you can feel free to answer these questions in the chat window as well, or of course, just to think of them uh, in your own mind. So similarities here, we have two sets of black and white photographs. Both of them are arranged in a grid. They repeat the same photographic conditions. So in Burnt and Hiller Besch's photographs, that is an overcast day, whereas it's the exact same spot with the exact same door in Eleanor Anton's work. There's a kind of exploration of shape and form, but these works are also kind of dry. They're kind of documentary and mechanical. There's an interest here in data and information. And there's also a sense that you could keep taking these photographs, that these projects are potentially endless. Burnt and Hillebesha are iconic conceptual artists. In this series, they're training their camera on obsolete buildings in the German countryside and making a kind of oblique reference to Germany's changing industrial landscape. In Eleanor and Tim's work, we see her borrowing this language. So there's the same kind of dry, data-driven photography going on here. But this time she's applying it to her own body. And she calls this work carving a traditional sculpture. So there's a connection here with Eve Klein's transformation of women's bodies into paintbrushes. Here she's transforming herself into a sculpture. But this work is also about gendered body ideals and the pressure for women to literally carve away their bodies through diet and exercise, to be smaller and to take up less space. It's quite a harrowing artwork when we think of this as carving through eating less and less. By contrast, we have this absolutely joyous, riotous, celebratory typology by Deborah Kelly. Here we see a different kind of survey of diverse human shapes and human forms. Uh, it's a series of 20 larger than life photographs and we see a variety of bodies here, younger and older, 
slimmer and larger, lighter and darker, male and female and also non-binary. I want to start by thinking about the poses taken by these bodies. Notice that they are open, confident and comfortable. Especially I want you to look at the way that their hands face out. Perhaps a moment away from giving us a hug or maybe they're in Shavasana pose. For any of us who have done yoga, that is the most wonderful pose at the end of the session when you lie on the ground, close your eyes and open out your palms. Collaged around and over their bodies is a beautiful array of flora and fauna. And these are painstakingly added by a whole group of participants. So the making of these artworks are kind of collective and conversational. But finally, we have to pay attention to the title of this artwork. No human being is illegal, in brackets, in all our glory. Deborah Kelly made this work in the context of dehumanizing policies and rhetoric in Australia about migrants seeking asylum in Australia. Against the absolute horrors of that humanitarian crisis, Kelly urges us to remember the beauty of human bodies. But even more importantly, she reminds us, reminds us of the holiness and the sanctity of human life. These bodies are precious. They are open and disarmed. They ask for love and for tenderness. And they insist that we value, honor and respect humankind. Oh, it's such moving and beautiful work. Let's pause there for any more questions. Okay, let me have a little look. Ah, so we have descriptions of Adrian Piper looking like a ghost and looking like she's taken the photograph in the window of a steamy bathroom. It is such an interesting photograph with the lights off, so kind of dark and mysterious. Uh, Natasha says she, uh, they wonder if the towers are meant to look like women's bodies. I absolutely think that the bashers are exploring the kind of sculptural qualities of these buildings, thinking about the beautiful shapes of these abandoned buildings. Someone asks, in relation to the Deborah Kelly, are they standing up or lying down? They are standing bodies, so we can imagine them in a studio with a white backdrop behind them. But you kind of see, for example, if we look at Ramesh's feet here, how firmly and confidently they are planted on the ground. And Ilian says, really appreciating your efforts to include works by uh, First Nations and non-binary people. Ah, Rosemary says uh, that the mimics also, the poses also mimic anatomical textbooks. That's yeah, absolutely perfect. They really do. There's some kind of a, uh, you know, medicinal connection here, isn't there? Uh, and Leslie says so much more joyous and relaxed than the last photograph that was controlled and makes me think of how we always try to control our weight. Yeah, absolutely. So a really kind of interesting uh, similarity and difference between the Eleanor Anten and the Deborah Kelly. All right, let's move on. So in this next series of artworks, there's a really fascinating shift from the nude as a genre in painting and sculpture toward an investigation of real bodies in public spaces and the kind of hierarchies and power dynamics of the clothed and unclothed bodies. 
here we see Marina Abramovic and Ule standing mute and nude facing one another. To enter the gallery, audience had to squeeze between the artist's bodies, prompting the question, do you turn left or do you turn right? And Lucinda, can we launch that next poll? So which way do you think you would enter this gallery? Would you face Ule? Would you face Marina? <laughs> would you hurry in maybe with your eyes shut or look for another entrance? Oh, always such fun to see those poll answers coming on through. So some of you who saw uh, the May series of talks might be reminded of Carsten Holler's left right slide, which also asks us to make a kind of, you know, inconsequential decision. All right. So most of us are going to turn right to Marina. Uh, a few of us will turn left and a good chunk are going to look for another entrance. Now, I am very short, so I would line up almost perfectly, I think, with Marina's breath if I turned, if I turned to Marina. So I think I might face Ule. <laughs> this performance has all of the kind of hallmarks of performance art. There's a kind of durational boredom here. Uh, the artists are kind of doing nothing and they do it for a long time. There's a collapse between artwork and artist or between object and subject. But there's also a kind of use of the nude body that is very deliberately distinct from self-portraits and portraiture, which we've just seen, which are about attempting to capture the individuality of the sitter. Instead, in these kinds of performance works, the artists attempt to make themselves blank canvases. These are neutral bodies, which are stand-ins for any human. Look, for example, at the way that they've done their hairstyles. In attempting to look like each other, the artists are also attempting to look like no one. And this removal of their clothing extends that intention. So they're kind of getting rid of any markers of time or location, uh, class or gender. But they've also made this performance deliberately uncomfortable. And this is another really strong tangent in contemporary art. Artists going out of their way to make audiences uncomfortable. They've actually modified the doorway. They've made it smaller, which means that audience have to literally squeeze to get past their bodies. And there's an awkwardness in this closeness. There's the possibility of stepping on their toes or accidentally touching them. Even worse, there's the possibility of scraping buttons and zippers against their bare flesh. So this work is a little bit like Eve Klein's performance in that it brings the nude body into the gallery. But it's also like Deborah de Roberta. Their bodies are too close. We're not given the distance required to make viewing their bodies pleasurable. And this work uh, operates in relation to a number of other performance art works that are about the clothed and unclothed body. Here we see three more. All of these seek to make audiences uncomfortable by playing with the power dynamics inherent to states of dress and undress, but also inherent to relations between the artist and the audience and between men and women. As I describe these artworks, I want you to keep these questions in mind. Who holds the power? 
in these interactions. Does this change with states of dress and undress? And how does this relate to gender? In the first photograph, we have Yoko Ono sitting on the floor with a pair of scissors. And she's inviting audience members to participate in this performance by making cuts to her clothing. Eventually, all of her clothing is removed and she leaves the stage. Valley Exports work, Tap and Touch Cinema, takes place in public. In this work, she's wearing a box around her chest and she's actually inviting male members of the public to reach through the box and touch her breast. So in this work, her body is touched but not seen. And we see here in this photograph that the man doing the touching then becomes the object of our gaze. So we watch him while he participates. And finally, we have a really interesting conceptual artist, Andrea Fraser. Here we see her captured mid speech. She's performing an artwork in a collector's home and the audience that we see behind her is other members of the art collecting world. She's striking this ebullient pose full of energy and power as she's dressed in expensive black underwear and high heels. In this work, she has collaged together snippets from different art world speeches. And she's also mimicking the different people who give those speeches, artists, directors, collectors. And in this kind of mishmash speech, she removes her clothes, bursts into tears, put her clothes back on, and then leaves. So it's a very kind of quirky version of commenting on the kind of rhetoric and rituals of art world openings. It's then even more complicated by the fact that this is a kind of entertainment uh, in a private art collector's home. So I'm not gonna give you any answers here. I'm merely putting those questions out there for you to think about. Who has the power in these artworks and does it change as the body is undressed or dressed? In this section, I want to finish with Archie Moore, who's extending these discussions on clothing and skin in relation to race. So we see his artwork, which is a t-shirt on the right, uh, and on the left, we see the artist himself, a topless Moore, uh, with fellow artist Brooke Stamp, who is wearing his artwork, My Skin. So we can see from this photograph that the T-shirt repro reproduces the details of Moore's body. We see his wonderful chest hair. Um, on the back, we see the indent of his Spine, and of course, we see this beautiful kind of patterning of freckles and blemishes and scars. So there's a kind of, you know, wonderful contradiction in this artwork of putting on clothing in order to be nude. But this is also about experiences of race and racism. So my skin promises us the kind of fantasy of putting on Archie Moore's light-skinned indigenous body uh, in order to experience the world through his skin. Of course, it also points to and reinforces that impossibility of ever knowing someone else's life and experiences. All right, let's pause for another moment there to go over any further uh, questions and comments. <laughs> okay, so thinking about the Abramovic and the Ule, 
Eliane says that she would crawl between their bodies, hopefully low enough to not be at an even more awkward height. Wonderful. Oh, Angelique says that they did this in New York, uh, squeezing through two women's bodies. And it's interesting to think about, does that change the artwork if you change the genders of the performers? We've got another crawler here from Elle. And Natasha says, are we the piece of art as we walk through them? Yes, absolutely. Estelle says, the nudes are in the power seats in the works by Yoko, Valley Export, and Andrea Fraser. Uh, the first two photos, the voyeurs seem to be more engaged in the task than the body, very interesting. So there's a kind of sense of doing that maybe distracts from looking. Mm, fantastic. All right, let's dive into our final selection of work. This is a tunic, what a joy. Before the sun rose on a chilly autumn morning, more than 5,000 Sydney fighters took off their clothes to create this temporary living installation by Spencer Tunic. He had been commissioned by the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras to come out to Australia and to create this celebratory uh, portrait of Sydney and Sydney fighters. Participants described it as a one in a lifetime opportunity, unmissable, and as generating a kind of tribal community among everyone who was there. Now, this is our final poll for today. Would you put on your birthday suit for a monumental moody pic? What do we think? I'll tell you a little bit more about the work as uh, those answers come in. So Tunic is famous for these photo shoots. He's organized them all around the world, contrasting a mass of human bodies with stunning and memorable architectural location. So these artworks belong to the world of the surrealists who absolutely delighted in things being out of place, but also in taking everyday things and making them strange. So here we have nude bodies looking like prawns. This work is also about a kind of performance of humanity. It's about encouraging participants to literally shed the baggage of social expectations and to celebrate bodies, not because of how they look, but because of the ways that they move, because they can hug and kiss and cluster and be together. All right, let's share those results. We have, oh, we're pretty evenly split. Uh, two of us says they have got a naked. I'm in that two, two of you. 30% uh, on yes, 34% on maybe, <laughs> and another solid third on no way. Well, Australians like getting naked. This was Tunic's second largest shoot to date. In his words, he says, way too many people want to get naked in Australia. He describes his artistic practice by saying that bodies are his medium. And I want to look at two photographs to help us think about the kind of materiality or physicality of human bodies. Quite a kind of joyous comparison here with carrots and with just an intimate portrait of two bodies. So on the left, we are looking at a work that was made just a few weeks ago and that caught headlines around the world. This was a graduating artwork by Rafael Perez Evans. He organized 31 tons of carrots to be poured into the courtyard at Goldsmiths. 
uh, a, college, a college um, of art. This is a recreation of a French farming practice, which is known as dumping. When there's an oversupply of farming produce, resulting in plummeting prices and farmers are faced with the you know terrible dilemma of actually paying for their produce to be taken away they can protest by dumping their produce in the streets this dumping highlights the insanity of capitalism which so regularly undervalues labor and food and so in this recreation, the mountain of carrots works as a kind of temporary sculpture, which we can look at for its aesthetic uh, uh, contemplation. So we can kind of think of this as quite similar to Spencer Tunick's collection of bodies. But of course, this work is also about the kind of scale and waste of contemporary consumption. On the right, we have a much more intimate work. This is by the artist Pixie Lau, and she's photographing herself with her younger boyfriend, Moro, in an underfurnished bedroom. Her body is almost entirely hidden by her partner, but she turns to face the camera and she uses a shutter release cable to take the photograph. This is just one photograph from her 13 year and ongoing project with her partner. In all of these photographs, she locates herself and her partner in unusual locations. And she says that this is a way of her exploring the possibilities and the limitations and the alternatives of being in a heterosexual relationship. So I want to talk about these three photographs in terms of their kind of formal similarities to each other. So all of these are about things being out of place. They're about the unusual arrangement of multiple forms. If we think about Spencer Tunic and Evans, the carrot, then we're thinking about the kind of visual power of scale, thousands of bodies and thousands of carrots, the way that these physically relate to each other when we pile them on top. But Lau's photograph also reminds us of the kind of individuality and intimacy that is also a part of Spencer Tunick's artwork. It kind of zooms in and scales down for a microscopic excerpt to focus on just two bodies and their relationship. So there's a kind of wonderful reminder in these two artworks that as human bodies, we are always part of the crowd. We're always part of something bigger than ourselves. But when we zoom in, there is also individuality and intimacy. Let's finish this morning with audiences getting married. Stuart Ringholt is an Australian artist and he invites audiences into galleries for nude art tours. And I'm actually going to finish this morning with a rather long quote from Ringholt because it just says so many wonderful things about the nude human body. Ringholt says, naked, our whole body experiences colour. We no longer just look at it, but now have the capacity to feel it. We can let it wash over us and feel its vibration. Nudity frees the spirit. It promotes positive body image and it is an opportunity to accept one's body, not despise it. It is educational, an education through feeling. We consider the notion that we are less sexualized with our clothes off than on. Where clothing engages the imagination and sparks the lust drive. Without the material registers of clothing, the nude body desexualizes. Being nude is fun and promotes happiness. 
wherever we are nude, whether it's in the bath, skinny dipping in the ocean, or making love, we are generally at our happiest.